Hello and greetings. I am so happy to be here with you today um, to talk about torts. This is the part one of our course that will serve as a bit of an introduction for the rest of our, our segments about what tort law is and, and what we're really talking about here. Um, I think tort law is one of the most exciting areas of law and something that that every lawyer really needs to know about. A lot of what we see on TV and the movies and in the movies is tort law. It's exciting. It's 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 two parties facing off, um, and we'll talk about that over the next several videos. Um, I have been working in the t field of torts for 15 years now, big cases and small cases. Um, so let's start a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an American attorney. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I've been working on tort cases from the beginning, uh, big cases and small cases and and really everything in between. Um, I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of my career working on the BP oil spill litigation. Um, that oil spill happened in 2010, but the litigation continued all the way through 2018. I believe part of it might still be going on as we speak. Um, but I've also helped, I've helped friends with small, uh, car crash cases, you know, a few dents in a car that cost a few hundred dollars to fix. It's still a tort case and all of the legal principles apply to even the smallest cases or the largest cases. In addition to my work in the law, I've also been uh, a legal Eng English class with Synergetics for about five years now. Um, I've met and worked with people from around the world trying to make their legal English a little bit better. Uh, and, and I like to think that I'm quite successful at it. Um, I travel. I'm currently in the process of moving to Argentina, but I've also spent a lot of time in Japan and I really love your country. It's such a beautiful place. The people are wonderful, the food is wonderful, and it's it's just an adventure. So I wanted to start this off with by talking just a little bit about what a tort is. It's definitely an old fashioned word. Uh, it comes from the old old English, and it's we'll talk about the specific definition in, in one or two slides. But it really is the basis of of private suits when two parties or two corporations sue each other and there's no contract. Um, to do tort law as a lawyer, writing is our number one asset. Um, I always say that um, our words are our swords in a battle and we can use our writing or our, or our spoken language to defeat our enemy. Um, there is also a vocabulary document attached to these videos and a quiz that comes later. Um, we won't talk about those too much right now, but they are supplementary to what we will be discussing. So what is a tort? Um, Black's Law Dictionary is uh, the, the number one dictionary of law terms in the world. Um, it's been used for a hundred years. Um, and there are dozens of editions. It's, it's a fantastic book for learning these obscure legal terms that we don't usually know about. Defined as a civil wrong other than a breach of contract for which a remedy may be obtained, usually in the form of damages. Now, there's a lot of vocabulary there, and we will cover them all in these videos. I absolutely promise. But a civil wrong is different than a public wrong or a criminal act. Uh, civil wrong means that there are two parties, uh, not the state, not the government, but, but private uh, individuals or corporations or anything else that has legal personality. Um, it's like a contract in many ways that if we break the rules, we can sue for breach. But without that con contract, that document, we rely on the public policy. It's a contract that we all share with each other, 
to not hurt each other. <laughs> and, and so in a way it's similar to contract. So what I'd like you to do here is I'd like you to just take 30 seconds where I will be quiet and think about what is tort? What is tort law? And what tort cases have you worked on in your career? Maybe it's none. Maybe you work only in the corporate world. But I am sure if you think about it, you'll think of some tort elements that we'll cover in these videos that are relevant for your career. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to discuss, just to, not to discuss, but to think about amongst yourself. And we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully cover some of this information soon. So I will go away for about 15, 20 seconds. Okay. I hope that was helpful. I hope that you took some time and just kind of thought inwardly about tort law. What, what maybe you learned in law school, what maybe you've experienced in life. But when, when we hear people yell at each other that I am going to sue you, that's usually because they're in tort. And that's what we say. We don't say um, that, that they have a tort or they are a tort. We usually say that they are in tort. Um, most lawsuits between people or corporations are in tort. And one very simple e example of this is if I were to punch you right in the face, you could sue me in tort. Now, and you can do that because there's no contract in place. But it's still not right for me to punch you in the face. So you can sue me in court in tort. Tort li liability comes from the law rather than the terms that we agree to in a contract. Now, when we say imposed by law, what do we mean? Um, the United States, for example, is a common law country where we base our, our laws on ju jurisprudence or judicial decisions. Um, tort law has developed over time, so, so we know that trespass is one of the intentional torts. And we know that if we go onto somebody else's land and we cause some kind of a damage, then they can sue us in tort for trespass. And if we lose, we may need to pay. We'll talk all about damages later. It's a very interesting subject. Tort, like most areas of the law, has its own vocabulary. And in many ways, it feels even more antiquated or old fashioned than other areas of the law. Tort law was one of the first areas of law to really develop in, in England um, and likely around the world. Um, and so they've held on to a lot of these old fashioned terms. Um, on TV or in the movies, for example, you may often hear a police officer or a detective uh, arrest somebody for assault and battery. And these terms are sometimes used interchangeably as if they mean exactly the same thing. But the reality is very different. They are very different legal concepts and we will discuss that later. Um, one issue here is that assault is also a crime. It's a criminal act. Um, and it has a different meaning in criminal law than it does in tort law. So this is why vocabulary is so interesting. And in part two of our video series, um, we are talking only about vocabulary. There will be a lot more vocabulary throughout all of these videos but part two will be focused only on the vocabulary of tort. Believe me, it's more exciting than it sounds. Now, 
in tort law, you're learning legal English. And I wanted to mention where legal English could be especially relevant. Um, the writing of a contract is very different than arguing a case in tort. Um, there are no preliminary documents in a tort case. It's all based on our arguments. Um, of course, we still write, and writing is is very important. It's it's the one skill that we as lawyers that that gives us our power, that gives us our wisdom and our strength. We may need to write opposing counsel. We may need to write to the court, maybe in pleadings, maybe in just a letter. Um, and we may, if the case is of special public importance, we may need to write press releases and op-eds in newspapers. All of this is designed to help bolster our case. Sometimes the public might not be interested, but other times, like with our BP oil spill litigation, the public is, is fundamentally involved, and having the public on our side is important. As is the case with all legal writing, making sure that our grammar and punctuation, our usage and our context, all straight is probably the number one thing to look out for. Um, one tool that we always recommend to get there is to use short sentences to build short paragraphs. One thing I see lawyers do more than anything else is try to include everything in one sentence. I've seen a sentence that can take the vast majority of a page, and by the end of it, to be perfectly honest, I have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. So the more, the, the more shorter your sentences and shorter your paragraphs, the better your legal writing will be. And now I'm going to give you what I think is our number one tip. It's a top secret tip that you won't find in many books. I don't think you could search this on the internet, <clears throat> but I will tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, that I use this rule on a regular basis. And it's simply looking out for any time we use the word of. It's a little two letter word that doesn't feel very important. And the reality is it's not. When we use a construction using that word of, uh, that could be something like a number of, that usually indicates a construction that we can replace with a single word. One tool to find out what we need to do is to read the sentence aloud. This is another thing I recommend doing in all of our legal writing, is if we're uncertain about a sentence or a phrase or a construction, Take a moment and read it out loud. I always say to use our newscaster voice, as if we're reading the, the evening news. And if it sounds natural, you're fine. But if it sounds awkward or it feels like something no normal person would ever say out loud, you may want to consider an edit. I'm going to show you just a couple really quick examples of this. I won't read this, but I'll let you take a quick look over 15 or 20 seconds, and then we can move on. I think the of rule is one of our best tools to avoid awkward legal writing. All of my students come back to me and say, I thought you were silly for telling me this rule when I heard it, but I'm using it every day, and it's making me a more confident and better writer. Now, the grammar of tort. Um, this is something that's interesting. And again, we're talking about old English words. Tort is a noun. It is never a verb. 
the person that commits a tort is called a tortfeasor. Like I said, it's a funny old fashioned word, but believe me, this is the right word to use when describing a person that commits a tort. So the person that trespassed on my property is a tortfeasor. <laughs> um, the, the, how that word was, where that word came from is a different lecture, but again, it's just very old fashioned. Um, you would never say something like, a person torted my car. It sounds funny, I agree, but no, a person commits a tort. Now, I'm going to make this as simple as possible because as you know, the law can become very complex. In essence, there are three types of torts. Those are the intentional torts, which we'll have a separate video. Negligence. Negligence is where a, a tort lawyer makes their money. This is the hard part, and it's also the fun part. We'll have an entire video all about negligence. And then there is something called strict liability. Strict liability is a very small number of, of situations where the government has passed a statute saying that certain behaviors are so inherently dangerous that if anything ever goes wrong with it, the person doing that activity is liable in tort. Um, this is not a, there are not a lot of, of these strict liability torts, um, but one, for example, is uh, when you're driving pilings for a building, for example, or blasting, uh, using, using explosives in your construction business. If anything goes wrong there, you're going to pay for it. So, liability is what all lawyers really want to know about. How or how does somebody become liable in tort? Who is liable in tort? It doesn't really matter whether it's intentional or negligence or strict liability. If A punches B in the face, the harm is obvious, right? It gets a little bit more tricky when A might just trip over a small stone that happens to be on B's property. That's theoretically negligence. And like I said, we'll get into that in a separate video very soon. And strict liability is the third one is when A's behavior has been deemed extraordinarily dangerous. And that's the language that most statutes use in strict liability. It must be extraordinarily dangerous. Okay, well, that's all I have on this video. Um, it, it's been nice to start this process, and I look, look forward very much to continuing this with a really great vocabulary lesson coming up next in part two. So stay tuned and I'll be right back with you. Have a great day everybody and I'll talk to you soon. Hello and greetings once again and welcome back to the Synergetics Legal English Tort Video Series. That's sure a mouthful. I'm glad, I'm glad we, we kept it short. Um, this is part two, where we're going to be talking about special vocabulary terms that we use in tort law. Like I said in part one, vocabulary is one of the most challenging parts of, of understanding this area of law because it uses a lot of very old terms. And we'll talk about some of them now. Um, I'd like to remind you all that there is a separate document uh, that has a longer list of, of, of tort based terms and their definitions and take a look at that for, for more depth. Um, but I wanted to take this opportunity here to go through a few of the terms that we, we use in tort and, and show how they might be important as we, as we learn English. Those of you that were here for part one, remember who I am. I won't spend as much time on the, on it this time but I'll let you maybe read the highlights. 
I'm an American lawyer that's been working in tort law and contract law for uh, 15 years, more or less. And um, I continue to work in these areas of law, and I really enjoy them. So, like I said, we're going to be talking about the vocabulary of tort in part two. And I also want to note the importance of using the right words, um, especially in the legal English context. When we have the right word to say something, uh, negligence, assault, uh, foreseeability, we should use that term. Um, it, it exists for a reason and it's important. Um, and to get there, I'd also note that it's important to always check your writing for what I call typography errors, typos. And while we rely on Microsoft or whatever word processor you use to help us catch these problems, it doesn't always work. Uh, for example, the word trail and the word trial. They mean very different things in the legal context, but they can be mistakenly used. So be very careful when, when, when writing. Make sure that you read your writing slowly so that you have the opportunity to catch these things. It's incredibly frustrating to mess up a word like that, especially if it ever gets to, the, to a final version. So let's start with some, tor some tort terms that, that I think are important to discuss. And one of them uh, is causation. Causation is, is uh, typically discussed in negligence cases. It, it basically means that we need to prove that the defendant caused the harm. And it's, it's, very, it's much more complicated than that. Um, in an intentional tort, I've been using this example of of A punching B in the face, causation is very easily. The punch caused the harm. But when we're talking about negligence, that, that analysis is much more nebulous. And it causes us, it forces us to consider terms like cause in fact or proximate cause. And cause in fact is very simple. It's the defendant did something that caused the harm, that started the process that ended in the harm. Easy. Proximate cause is much more difficult and is, is the bane of many law students around the world. And it just requires a sufficient connection between the defendant's action and the injury to impose liability on him. We'll discuss that a little bit more in the negligence section later on through this PowerPoint. But for right now, it's important to just think about that. What is the difference between a, a cause in fact, a cause that something actually caused a result, versus only a connection between that act and, and the damage? Like I said, we'll cover this later in more detail. It's, it's very complex, but it's also a term that's important to use, especially when we're talking about a negligence case. Now, torts also have a number of defenses that the defendant can raise when sued. Um, and this is an incomplete list of defenses to a tort claim. Um, one of them comes from the att attractive nuisance doctrine, and it's the short version is if you have a piece of land with a swing set or a slide on it, let's say something that a child would naturally gravitate to, that person, the person that owns that land, has to see, has to understand that children coming would be foreseeable. This is another big term that we will cover in depth. 
um, that children would arrive, and therefore they may have liability for any harm that results. Um, assumption of the risk is another important one. Now, let's say that you are an extreme sports enthusiast, and you choose to jump out of an airplane with a parachute for fun. I've never done this, but I would really enjoy doing it sometime. It sounds absolutely thrilling. But let's say that as you're landing, your leg hits a little funny and you twist your ankle. Just a minor injury, nothing to, nothing to go to the hospital about. But because you're already doing a, a dangerous activity, you're assuming the risk of being hurt. Now, you'll see that uh, when you do these kinds of things, they will often make you sign legal waivers that, that say that you are assuming the risk. And that's exactly what you're doing. Um, it's also related to the one below it, consent. Um, <laughs> if I say, please, please, please punch me in the face, and then you do it, I will not be able to turn around later and sue you for it. Um, it's basically that I agree to, to the act, I agree to the situation, and, and I won't sue because of it. Another is defense of others or defense of property, meaning that if you see somebody being uh, held at gunpoint on the street and you use force to stop it, that criminal cannot then sue you for a tort. I know this, this sounds logical and that it makes sense. I, I, I fully understand. But it's still that situation is one where a third party causes harm to a to a party, a potential plaintiff, and and un, without this defense, they could sue theoretically. Now, and a very interesting one, I think, is the idea of an intervening cause versus a superseding cause. And these are two very different but related concepts in the law. Let's say that um, I, I'm in a car crash and I'm slightly injured. And while I'm on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, the ambulance is also in a car crash and I'm further injured. Now, who could I sue? Um, in this case, that would be what we call an intervening cause. It, it's an event that produces harm after the initial injury is suffered. That doesn't mean that we, we are limited to the second car crash only, but it means we can sue everybody, <laughs> which is always fun. A superseding cause, on the other hand, is something, an event that happens after that initial injury, but it cuts off the defendant's liability. Um, we'll talk about this later as well a little bit, but it, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a balancing test between where that second car crash really is just a continuation of the first harm. But if I'm sitting in the hospital minding my own business and let's say medical malpractice happens and I die, that's not really the responsibility of the first party now, is it? It's, it's a very complex issue. And if you ever wanted to write a, a long paper on it, that would be a good subject. The duty of care. Now, this is an important part of negligence. And it's a theoretical duty. It's not anything that's written down. It's that we have to behave like a, like a, like a reasonable person behaves. That doesn't mean that we have to prevent every injury. It just means we have to act reasonably to prevent every injury. We all have a duty of care. We all have a duty of care to maintain our house in a safe manner, uh, to drive reasonably. Um, this is all part of a famous American justice of the Supreme Court, whose name is Learned Hand. What a fantastic name that is for a judge, Learned Hand. And he came up with this entire formula about what negligence really is. 
And this is definitely, definitely something we'll talk about in the negligence section. But it all comes down to a duty of care. And then did we, did we act according to that duty of care? Did we breach that duty of care? That's the, that's the important thing to consider. Here's a rule, and I threw this in vocabulary because it's kind of an interesting rule, and it has an interesting name. It's called the eggshell skull rule. And it, it basically means that a tortfeasor is liable for all consequences resulting from their activities, from their tortious activities that cause injury. So let's say that um, a normal looking, healthy looking adult is sitting having dinner and a young child walks by and just kind of like pokes him in the face. But, but this little child had no idea that he suffered from a, a crippling medical condition where he has bones that are like glass. And even that little poke really harmed this person, seriously injured the person. That child, or in, more, in, in truth, that child's parents would still face the full liability this all comes down to the, the act itself. This child intended to poke this person. That is the requisite intent for a tort. You do not need to intend to seriously injure someone. You, all you had to intend was that little poke and you're liable in tort for all damages resulting. It's a little scary if you think about it from the from the defendant's side, but it makes perfectly good sense from the plaintiff's perspective. Foreseeability, negligence and negligence per se. I, like I said in part one, negligence is where we make our money as a tort lawyer. If you've ever traveled to the United States and seen these advertisements from lawyers on the television, have you been in a car crash, call today, these kinds of things. That's all tort and that's all negligence. And foreseeability has become one of the most important things to consider. And it's really just how predictable that event is. Um, if I were to get drunk and drive my car recklessly, it's quite foreseeable that damage could result. I would never do such a thing, but, but yes, that's a good example. Negligence uses foreseeability to help determine the duty that is owed, that duty of care that we mentioned. Um, and so it's a, it's a calculation. It's almost like algebra to figure this out. Um, but negligence is based when there is a duty, a duty of care, somebody, the defendant breaches that duty, and the plaintiff is harmed. So there's never a tort without a harm or without damage. Um, if I were to walk on your land, which is technically a trespass, but I didn't touch anything and nothing got damaged, there's no real tort there. He might still be able to sue me and a court might give what they call nominal damages, something like $1, but without any damages, why would we ever want to go to, go to court? Uh, I've had many of my friends call me and say, I hurt myself on somebody's land and I'd like to sue them. And I always tell them, how bad did you hurt yourself? Did you go see a doctor? Did you go to the hospital? Did you miss any work? And the answer is always no. It's always, I didn't really hurt myself. I just stubbed my toe and I thought I could make a quick buck. <laughs> Some friends I have, huh? Um, anyway, moving on. Negligence per se is an interesting concept as well. In Latin, it literally translates to negligence by itself. And we use that to prove negligence 
through the violation of a statute. For example, if you were speeding on a highway, you were going 150 miles an hour in your Maserati, violating that statute means that you're already negligent per se if any harm arises. Intent. Now, I know I've, I've mentioned negligence a lot, but there's an entire category of intentional torts. Now, we'll have a section about them. I think they're fun. I really enjoy talking about them. But intentional torts are things like assault, battery, false imprisonment, um, trespass, conversion. Conversion is just a, a, a fancy word for stealing. Um, but intent. In those kinds of torts, we have to show that the defendant desired to bring about the consequences of the act. Now, do they have to desire to bring all of the consequences? No, they really don't. They just need the desire to have an intentional act start the process. And finally, this is our last term that we'll cover here. And then we're going to stop, stop again and move on to our next section. Vicarious liability. This is an incredibly important uh, concept in the law. Um, it means it, it allows a, a third party to have liability on the second party's behavior. This typically happens in employment. For example, let's say that you are uh, hit by a an Uber delivery uh, vehicle, right? You're, you're, you're run down by somebody getting a pizza delivered. Now, the person that hurt us is the driver, just the driver. Um, and we could certainly sue that driver for the harm they caused. But um, I'd much rather sue Uber than the driver because the Uber has more money. <laughs> and when that employee, that, that driver was working for Uber, Uber assumes responsibility for their employees' actions. This is called vicarious liability. It also applies when a younger child commits a tort and the parents are forced to pay the damages. It's not especially fair, but it's the way uh, the common law legal system has been established. Oh, and I was wrong. We do have one, one more. Excuse me. This is a fun one. Another another quick one from Latin. And it's called res ipsa loquitur, which translates to the event speaks for itself. It's really just it's a way that we can prove negligence using uh, circum uh, uh, using non-direct evidence. I'm sorry, I lost a word in my brain. But we have to do that. We have to prove three things. That we have the incident was of a type that does not generally happen without negligence. It was caused by an instrumentality, like a car, for example, slowly in the defendant's control. And the plaintiff did not contribute to the cause. In that case, we can show negligence uh, much more easily. Okay, that's our, our, our primer on vocabulary. Our next section is, like I said, one of the fun ones, and I think you'll enjoy it greatly. It's called, it's intentional torts. And, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoy talking about it. Until that time, have a wonderful day, and we'll speak again very soon. Hello once again, and welcome back to part three, our discussion on intentional torts. This is a really fun one for me. I've got to say it's one of the more enjoyable uh, topics. I, I know a lot about it, but believe it or not, this is not really the kind of case I've worked on very much. It's less common in the law, but it gives you a good foundation in tort law. Um, 
If you've already been to one or two of these video sessions, you know all about me. I'm an American lawyer that specializes in tort law. I've worked on big cases and small cases and everything in between. Um, I've also been teaching English with Synergetics for five years now, and I couldn't be happier. So let's get on with the good stuff and get in into intentional torts. Luckily, they are exactly what they sound like they are. They're a, they're a harm that arises when somebody intends to cause it. Um, there's no negligence involved here. It is, it is all about a defendant's intended actions. Okay. Um, they are not especially common in the law. They do happen, and there are lawsuits about them. I'm not saying that this is unimportant in any way, but they're less common, probably because when a defendant causes harm intentionally, they already know that they're going to have to pay. Lots of settlements are reached before trial in this area. It's one of those things. People, people do dumb things to each other all the time, and and sometimes the courts must get involved to assist. But when we're talking about intentional torts, we're really talking about six main categories. Again, this is not complete. This is a, uh, but this is the you know ninety nine percent of the torts are are going to fall in these six categories. And they are assault, battery, false imprisonment, trespass, conversion, and defamation. All of these are good and all of these are important. And like I just said um, 30 seconds ago, how, how this doesn't happen very much and I haven't been involved in many cases. You know, we just have to look to last year, uh, the defamation cases uh, involving Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, if you're in the celebrity world, was a massive verdict. It was uh, $15 million, more or less. Even more so, currently, there's a defamation, in, defamation case in the United States where the plaintiffs are seeking $1.6 billion. That is against uh, Fox News and, and their people, against the, the Dominion voting machine people. Um, we don't have to get into any of that, but they, these do happen, and defamation cases are difficult to prove, sure, but if you can, there's definitely some real money there. Um, but we're going to talk about each one of these in turn so we get a little better grasp about what these words mean and how we can use them. An assault. An assault is an intentional act that puts another person in reasonable apprehension of imminent, harmful, or offensive contact. That's a fancy way of saying it's an intentional act that causes someone to become afraid. You don't have to touch this person at all, um, but they must have intended to 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 touch that person or or or, or to at least have the the plaintiff feel that 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 fear um i think the easier way to do this is to show you a cartoon so here we go <laughs> okay you'll see there uh that the guy on the right the guy in the blue um he's throwing a stone at the guy on the left the guy in the black or green i can't quite tell um, but he doesn't hit him. Um, assault, the defendant throws the stone and causes fear. Um, now, here, the real image, generally speaking, in an assault case is what are the damages? Um, in this case, I am assuming that the guy on the left simply ran away and never, never spoke about it again. It's not that big of a fear. Um, that would, would really affect his life. But I'm sure if you think about it for a few seconds, uh, you can think of, of something that could happen that, that could really change somebody's life. Hypothetically, let's say, um, you, I, let's say that you had an old boyfriend or girlfriend 
and you called them and told them that you had a, a sexually transmitted disease. Now, that would scare me to death, absolutely. Um, I mean, if it's true, they should do that, and it's reasonable. But but if, if it's just to cause fear, and it's just to make me upset, and it causes me to lose my job, or not be able to go outside, or or spend milli- millions unnecessarily on doctors, then there could be some damages. So, so think about assault just as the fear that somebody else is caused, somebody else causes. We can use assault as both a noun and a verb. The tortfeasor committed an assault. He threatened to assault me. I was assaulted by him. It's a very flexible word that fits in almost any any part of speech. Um, and so unlike tort, <laughs> which is only a noun, um, assault can be a verb and a noun. Now, related to an assault is a battery. And again, these are often used collectively. Um, if you try to punch me in the face, I'm going to be afraid. I will have felt assaulted. But the moment that you punch me in the face, it's no longer an assault alone. It is also a battery. So um, what, what is a battery? It's when a person, the defendant, intentionally causes harmful or offensive contact with another person. So I don't have a good cartoon on this one, but I've got a nice image. This is a battery. Um, It can be, it doesn't have to be a punch. It could be any kind of harmful contact. Again, much like assault, uh, a battery can be both a noun and a verb. Okay, this this next one is an interesting one for me because it's it's called it's called false imprisonment. And it's basically when somebody else, a defendant, restrains another person. Um, And this could be anything. It just needs to be a restricted area. Um, If if you were to come to my house and I locked you inside all the doors. That's a false imprisonment. If if I were at a store and the security guard accused me of shoplifting and he takes me to that back room, that could be a false imprisonment. They have some rights as a security guard that can detain somebody with reasonable suspicion. But but it's it's still a false imprisonment, especially if you find that they targeted you for some reason beyond you being a shoplifter. It's kidnapping. <laughs> Anytime you, you, you restrain somebody in one location, um, and that can change, that location can change. If you put somebody in a house and then put somebody in a car and then put somebody in a basement, it's all part of one big false imprisonment. And, and again, this is an intentional tort, requires intent. Um, damages can be a little difficult to prove here. Um, you know, maybe it's the time that you've lost. Maybe it's more emotional distress that you've suffered. But if you ever find yourself with a client that's been locked up, not in jail, but by, but by a private person, you may want to consider adding false imprisonment as a cause of action to your complaint. Trespass. This can be both to land or to things, Um, but it's the intentional knowing entering of another person's property without permission. Now, like I've mentioned in in the last video, 
Um, it's very difficult to to find damages here if that defendant isn't doing anything. Now, if that person has crossed into your land and has started drilling for oil and they find oil, well, then they're stealing from you. <laughs> um, but that all stemmed from a trespass. It's it's basically a protection on our liberty to control our own property. Okay, conversion. This is one word that that it, it it doesn't actually sound like what it is. It's 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 stealing the property of another person. Now, in the criminal field, we know that theft or robbery is a crime, and you can go to jail or prison for it. But if a person is convicted of robbery, it doesn't necessarily mean that the money or the or the property goes back to the real owner. Conversion is a tort, and it basically gives a private cause of action to sue the person that stole from you. You have to show that there is an intent to deprive the plaintiff from their property. But, for example, if, if, if you were to come to my house and steal my bicycle, and you told me I am not giving it back, I could really easily sue you in tort, and you'd, you'd probably have to pay me the value of the bicycle or give it back. Its, it's damages are a little bit more complicated. Um, conversion, uh, like battery and assault, works both as a noun and a verb again. And finally, defamation. This is an entire area of law that we could spend an entire session on. <clears throat> but I won't, I won't take too much time. Um, the real rules on defamation are, it's a statement that injures a third party's reputation. If I tell you that you smell bad <laughs> and you don't, um, that is defamation. Um, especially if I'm telling it to people you work with or people that you live with, or, um, people that are important to you. Your reputation is important and, and we're trying to protect, protect it from third parties, uh, damaging it. Now, there are a million exceptions to when defamation applies. The most important one is that there is no defamation tort if what you're saying is true. Truth is an absolute defense to a defamation claim. Um, now, that's sometimes easier, easier said than done. Um, I'll also make one other distinction between libel and slander. And the rules don't change very much, but they're very different concepts. Libel is when you write something. I am writing a news article about a person and I, I make defamatory statements. Uh, that's, that's what happened in the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial. Um, slander is still defamation, but it's not written. It's spoken. It's not a recording. It's just me talking to other people. Um, there are vast complexities in defamation law. It matters whether the plaintiff is a common person or is a public person. Uh, the standard of, of a defamation claim goes up much higher for a public person, where we have to show that the defendant acted with actual malice. If we're two just common people, not celebrities, no, we don't go on TV or anything, people like myself, people like yourselves, I presume, 
then we don't have to show actual malice. We just have to show that harm occurred. But like I said, the most famous recent case um, on defamation is this Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. Um, it was fun for me because it was on, it was televised streaming and I watched as much as I could. It was just, it was kind of a fun diversion for a, a couple of weeks. Um, but defamation is a real case that is really, really difficult to win. But if you do, there's big money there. Um, and that's what I have for you today on the intentional torts. It's a good, it's a good primer on where we're going next. And we're going into the world of negligence. And like I've told you, negligence is where we all make our big money, um, at least in the tort world. Uh, I like it because on the plaintiff side, we don't have to track hours. We just have to track our recovery. <laughs> but, but there's a lot of other reasons to like it. And if you're on the defense side of torts, it's just as fun. You, know, you bill by the hour that way, but it's, it's still a lot more exciting than 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 a merger, for example, even though those can be good too. Um, I'll be back soon with part four, where we're going to be talking in depth about negligence. Hello, and I am back for part four of the Synergetics tort video series. This time we're going to be talking about negligence. And I would, I would estimate that 80 or more percent of all tort cases are in negligence. It's just the way the world works. Um, it's, we are harmed more by negligent behavior of others than by intentional behavior of others. And so negligence is how, um, we prove that harm was, was caused by a defendant. Um, Negligence law has been developed over centuries, and some of it is a little bit complex. But at the end of the day, it's really best to just think about this as somebody neglected to take care of something and somebody was hurt as a result of it. They didn't mean to, but that doesn't really matter here, does it? The only thing that matters was that they did something and somebody got harmed. That's, that's the most important bit. I often call negligence where tort law lives, because if you ever have a job as a lawyer or anything else in a, in a, in a tort based law firm, you'll see that this is where the action is. This is where the money is made. This is, this is where TV shows and movies are made. Um, whether you're talking about Aaron Brockovich and a mass tort about, about water uh, contamination or uh, a little old lady that slips and falls in a grocery store. This is all negligence law. Um, and it's the reason that lawyers have jobs. <laughs> um, we'll talk about negligence a little bit. We have, we can't do everything here, but I want to also highlight this learned hand formula. I've mentioned him before in these videos, and he's a, a famous, now dead, uh, Supreme Court justice that really helped develop tort law in the United States. So what is negligence? Um, even though I can tell that a lawyer wrote this, it is a very good summary of what negligence really is. It is a failure to behave with the level of care that someone of ordinary prudence would have exercised under the same circumstances. The behavior usually consists of actions, but it can also consist of omissions when there is some duty to act. Um, that's a whole complex uh, category of law. But yes, it's not just what you do. It's also what you don't do. Um, there's a, a, a good Samaritan statute, at least in Florida, that says that once you start helping somebody, somebody that's in danger, whether it's a natural disaster or a crime, once you start helping, you can't stop. <laughs> so once you start helping, you, you have a legal duty 
to reasonably continue. Um, so the emissions could also play a role in, in this as well. And the first thing we've always got to look at is whether there was a duty, a legal duty of care on the defendant. And one way that we can look at this is, is through this four-pronged test. Um, the easy way is if the defendant engaged in the creation of the risk itself. So if the defendant's property has a trench built on it that the defendant built that was unreasonably dangerous and somebody gets hurt, then we know that there was a duty of care established. The, the defendant actually acted and didn't act reasonably safely. Um, another way to tell if there's a duty is if there's a voluntary undertaking. If the defendant volunteers to protect the plaintiff from harm or the plaintiff's property from harm, uh, one of the, one example of this would be if you park your car in a parking lot. Um, the contract that, that might result they, they usually have contractual waivers of this voluntary undertaking. But if they don't, you expect your car to come back the same way you left it. And by taking that car, the parking lot owner, the parking lot owner owes you a duty of care. Um, simple knowledge is another way to establish a duty of care. If the defendant knows or should have known that the conduct will harm the plaintiff, that's pretty easy to, to show a duty of care. If the defendant is out there admitting that what he did harmed somebody, there you go. That, that's bordering on an intentional tort, even though I think it would stay in the negligent world. Finally, business or voluntary relationships can impact whether there is a duty or not. Uh, if you're a guest at a hotel or an inn, they have a duty to protect you from harm. Um, if you own land and you open it to the public, maybe you build a small park on it, you are assuming a duty of care, a duty to protect the people that comes there. Um, these are just some ways that we can prove that a duty of care existed. And now we finally get to how we determine whether there was a breach of that duty of care. And we finally get to the hand formula. Uh, in the famous Supreme Court case, United States versus Carol Towing. I believe it was from 1947, but I'm not sure. It's in that time frame. The formula is very simple. I, I think I said in one of these other videos that it's much like algebra. And it is, especially here. So there's a breach, a provable breach in tort when the burden of taking precautions is less than the probability of the loss times the gravity of the loss. Uh, if you can, if you can make that formula work, then there will be negli negligence liability. Um, it's, it's an old rule. I mean, here we are, it's almost 75 years old, and yet it's still as strong today as it ever has been, maybe even more so. But if the burden of taking precautions is less than the probability of injury multiplied by the gravity of any resulting injury, then the party with the burden of taking precautions will have some amount of liability. Now we're talking law school stuff, right? Fun. <laughs> there are four elements to establish a prima facie case of negligence. We have to show that the defendant had a legal duty of care, which we've talked about a little bit. We have to show that the, def that the defendant breached that duty of care we have to show that the plaintiff suffered an injury. And finally, we have to prove 
that defendant's breach of the duty caused the injury. This brings us back full circle to proximate cause, which we talked a little bit about in the vocabulary section. Again, this is a complex situation, and, and really it's easier to consider the facts of a case. And perhaps the best way to do that is through a case study or a video even. This is only about two minutes long, so I'll let, let it play through and it will explain one of the most famous cases in the history of American jurisprudence. Um, it's commonly referred to as Palsgraf, who was the plaintiff. Um, and I'll play the video and I'll let, and, and I'm curious to let you, to, about what you think. In Paul's Graf versus Long Island Railroad, Mrs. Paul's Graf was standing on a train platform when a man carrying a package rushed aboard a moving train owned by the Long Island Railroad. Two train employees pushed and pulled the man onto the train, causing the package, which was filled with fireworks, to fall onto the tracks. The rear wheels of the train ran over the package, causing it to explode. The explosion caused the scale on the platform to fall onto and injure Mrs. Paul's Graf. Mrs. Paul's graph sued the Long Island Railroad, arguing that had it not been for the railroad employees pushing the man with the package, the package would have never fallen and exploded, and the scale would have never fallen onto her. Paul's graph wins at the trial and appellate levels, and the railroad appeals to New York's highest court, the Court of Appeals of New York. Justice Cardozo, who would later become a U.S. Supreme Court justice, writes for the majority and holds that the railroad is not liable for Paul's graph's injuries because her injuries were not a reasonably foreseeable consequence of the railroad's negligence. This idea that a duty of care is only owed to reasonably foreseeable plaintiffs has since come to be known as the zone of danger test. Here, the package didn't appear to be dangerous, so it wasn't reasonably foreseeable by the railroad employees that their actions would lead to Paul's graph's injuries. Justice Andrews, writing for the dissent, says that a duty to one is a duty to all, meaning that if the injury can be traced to the wrongful act with no intervening events, then this is sufficient to establish liability. Paul's graph would not have been injured but for the railroad employee negligently pushing the passenger, causing him to drop the package. The Paul's graph case is a landmark case in tort law. It helped establish the idea of proximate cause as a limit on the scope of tort liability. Proximate cause means that you can only hold a defendant liable for harm that is a reasonably foreseeable result of the defendant's wrongful act. In Paul's graph versus In Paul's graph versus
Okay, before we move on, I hope that kind of explained this idea of foreseeability and proximate cause. It's really tricky. Foreseeability is the ability to predict the future, and who can do that, really? Well, we all can a little bit. It, we just can't see things that are unforeseeable. So that's, that's what we're talking about in negligence. There's a limit to liability. One other massive limitation is called comparative negligence. Now, this is not available in every jurisdiction. This is different in my place, my home of New Orleans, than it is in, say, New York or California. It's different all over the country. Maybe half the states allow it, other, the other half do not. But it's a, it's a tort principle that will re reduce the damages by whatever role the plaintiff played in getting injured. And again, I've got a nice little video to help, to help make this as clear as possible. In this video, we will discuss comparative negligence. The rule in comparative negligence is that a plaintiff's damages in a negligence lawsuit will be reduced or even eliminated based on the percentage of his own carelessness. Let's say Perry is being careless by playing a video game as he crosses a street. Here comes David, who is going too fast on his skateboard while listening to music. And David slams into Perry. Perry has $100,000 in damages and sues David. And let's say the jury decides that David is 60% responsible for the accident. And Perry is 40% responsible for the accident. The jury decides that Perry was also careless. Perry's own carelessness contributed to the accident. And the traditional rule of contributory negligence would be that Perry gets nothing. But the traditional rule of contributory negligence is no longer the law in most states. Most states apply comparative negligence, where we compare the defendant's degree of fault against the plaintiff's degree of fault. Perry's degree of fault was 40%, so his damages are reduced from $100,000 to $60,000. Many states modify their rules of comparative negligence. For example, in some states, if the plaintiff is 50% or more responsible for his own injuries, then he cannot recover damages in a negligence lawsuit. In, in this
Okay, guys, that's what I've got on negligence. And I know I just... I just cracked the door on, on the complex issues in negligence. But we have one last video session that will be kind of a grab all on some other smaller issues in tort law. And it will cover things like mass torts and malpractice law and a few other subjects that don't quite have enough for a, a, a video of their own. Um, Negligence is a great, great place to live and work. It's where we make our money as a tort lawyer, and and it's a lot of fun. Um, we'll be back with, an, with one last video, but I hope you're enjoying these so far, and I look forward to, to making more for you in the future. Have a great day, everybody. Hello and greetings once again, and welcome back to the Synergetics Legal English Tort Video Series. That's sure a mouthful. I'm glad, I'm glad we, we kept it short. Um, this is part two, where we're going to be talking about special vocabulary terms that we use in tort law. Like I said in part one, vocabulary is one of the most challenging parts of, of understanding this area of law because it uses a lot of very old terms. And we'll talk about some of them now. Um, I'd like to remind you all that there is a separate document uh, that has a longer list of, of, of tort-based terms and their definitions. And take a look at that for, for more depth. Um, but I wanted to take this opportunity here to go through a few of the terms that we, we use in tort and, and show how they might be important as we, as we learn English. Those of you that were here for part one, remember who I am. I won't spend as much time on, the, on it this time, but I'll let you maybe read the highlights. I'm an American lawyer that's been working in tort law and contract law for uh, 15 years, more or less. And um, I continue to work in these areas of law, and I really enjoy them. So, like I said, we're going to be talking about the vocabulary of tort in part two. And I also want to note the importance of using the right words, um, especially in the legal English context. When we have the right word to say something, uh, negligence, assault, uh, foreseeability, we should use that term. Um, it, it exists for a reason and it's important. Um, and to get there, I'd also note that it's important to always check your writing for what I call typography errors, typos. And while we rely on Microsoft or whatever word processor you use to help us catch these problems, it doesn't always work. Uh, for example, the word trail and the word trial. They mean very different things in the legal context, but they can be mistakenly used. So be very careful when, when, when writing. Make sure that you read your writing slowly so that you have the opportunity to catch these things. It's incredibly frustrating to mess up a, a word like that, especially if it ever gets to the, to a final version.